Tis the season to shine with H&M. Discover the holiday collection and find fashionable pieces for your wardrobe or for under the tree. Get inspired and dazzle with this year's glam. From tuxedo styles, bow detailed pieces, impressive prints, and more. From unforgettable looks to unforgettable gifts. With fashion finds to home decor, find it all at H&M. Treat your loved ones and yourself this season. Shop in-store or at hm.com. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Selling a little or a lot? Do your thing however you cha-ching with Shopify, the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout. 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms. Get a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash offer 23. Food Heals Podcast, episode 168. The six dimensions of wellness are emotional, social, spiritual, environmental, intellectual, and then physical. Holistic Voice presents the Food Heals Podcast with your hosts, Alison Melody and Susie Hardy. Join the Food Heals Nation and learn the secrets to go from feeling unwell to healing yourself. Warning, side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, an increase in sexual activity, feelings of joy, cravings for kale and quinoa, and a spike in Tinder matches. In real cases, women have experienced a strong desire to stop asking their boyfriends if they look fat and stress. If you experience any of these symptoms, post a selfie to Instagram immediately. Welcome, Food Heals Nation. Thanks for joining us. I'm Allison Melody. And I'm Susie Hardy. Today's guest is Kathy Patalski. She's the creator of the vegan food blog, Healthy, Happy Life, and author of the cookbooks, 365 Vegan Smoothies and Healthy, Happy Vegan Kitchen. Kathy is also the founder of the popular website, FindingVegan.com, which launched the Finding Vegan app in 2015. Kathy graduated with a degree in health promotion from American University in Washington, D.C. She also spent a year studying art at Otis School of Art and Design. Her blog is emerging of her favorite things, art, food, wellness, a love of animals, one of our favorites, and the environment and people. Those are like all my favorite things. (laughs) But first... Wine. Oh, oh, and wine. Yeah, Kathy got it right about wine. (laughs) But first, have you tried and tried and tried... And tried? And tried (laughs) to lose weight. But even if you make some progress initially, you may fall off the wagon and then gain it back. Are you tired of squeezing into your clothes or having to buy bigger sizes and you wish you could figure out why you're not losing weight or keeping it off? Maybe you're eating less and exercising more, but you're not seeing results and it's frustrating. If any of this rings true, then we want you to know you're not alone. It's not your fault you've struggled to maintain a healthy weight. So many of the exercise, diet, and weight loss programs out there focus on the exterior or the visible, how many pounds you've shed or how many inches you've lost, but they fail to address the invisible. First of all, they don't address what's going on inside your body, the changes in your hormone levels, metabolism, muscle mass, and bone density as you age, all of which affect your appearance. Secondly, they don't address this critical topic, your relationship with yourself, which we talk a lot about. But this relationship is one of the inner causes of weight gain, the emotional or spiritual issues that cause you to struggle with your weight and your health. J.J. Flizanes, author of The Invisible Fitness Formula, Five Secrets to Release Weight and End Body Shame, wants to help. Yes, she does. J.J. has launched the Invisible Fitness Academy, which is a five-month course with weekly trainings for total body transformation. It's also an online community, a safe, judgment-free space where you get the support and accountability you need to elevate and challenge yourself into a new way of being to further your true growth. It really is a beautiful community, and if you want to learn how to join her transformational program, go to foodhealsnation.com slash JJ, and if you join by September 30th, we will also give you five months access free to our VIP club, the Food Heals VIP club with never before heard podcast episodes. They'll help you boost your health and your wellness, and we'll tell you more about this after our interview with Kathy. Next up, our interview with Kathy. Yay! The Food Hills Podcast starts now. Today we're here with an amazing guest who I've admired for a long time. She's from FindingVegan.com, Kathy Patalski. Finding Vegan features the latest and greatest vegan recipes and finds submitted by their global community of uber-talented food bloggers. I can vouch for that. I love everyone on the site. 
On her website, you can browse recipes, get inspired, and add more plant-based meals to your day, your week, your month, your year, your life. Then wash, rinse, do the dishes, and repeat. So honored to be speaking with Kathy today. Welcome, Kathy. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you for having me. (laughs) Yeah, we're so glad to have you. You have an extensive resume. I know you do a lot. So for our listeners, can you just give them a taste of who you are and what you do? I'm Kathy Patowski, and I am a vegan food blogger and cookbook author. I have two websites, healthyhappylife.com and also findingvegan.com. Finding Vegan is actually more of a community site where vegan bloggers or any blogger really submits vegan recipes and it's very browsable. I've been doing this full time for about 10 years now. So it's my job Mm -hmm. (laughs) to cook delicious vegan food and share it with the world. I mean, that's amazing that you are a vegan blogger who does it full time because we know that that's a hard place to get to. And so we're super impressed when people are doing it. How did you first get into it? Like what sparked your interest and how did you go about, you know, creating that career? Well, I've always been inspired by wellness, even when I was a little girl, which sounds so silly, but I would ask for like exercise videos and nutrition books and recipe books. And I was always in the kitchen as a kid and my mom was always teaching me about healthy cooking. So it's really comes from my childhood. The way I actually got into blogging was I just finished college. I had just gotten married. We just moved up to New York City, and I did not have a job. (laughs) In this big city, I had no friends. I didn't know what I was doing. So I was basically at home all day cooking, and because that's what I do. (laughs) You're like baking and doing recipes. And I was also illustrating a children's book brand called The Lunchbox Bunch that I kind of Mm -hmm. created, and I wrote some children's books, and I was trying to break into the children's book industry, and that wasn't going very well. It's very competitive. But this little blog that I had started for that brand just took off, and Mm -hmm. I started to get traffic on it, and it was just all vegan recipes. So I kind of quit the children's brand and focused on the blog. That was in like 2006, right when blogs were just starting to be a thing. So, And I I feel like wellness was also becoming such a thing back then too. Yeah, the word vegan was a new buzzword really. Yeah. What made you go vegan in the beginning? Well, I definitely gravitated towards being a vegetarian from a young age. I grew up in Santa Cruz, which is, you know, very... (laughs) Farmer's markety, hippie. Begin with. So I, yeah, <laughs> Let's just say it. Dog, whatever granola, granola, um, hippie. <laughs> Elizabeth Castora always says she she had the hippie card because she grew up in like Berkeley. <laughs> I'm like I kind of had the hippie card too. Uh, so I I didn't really eat meat as a kid. I would pick the pepperonis off of my pizza. Mm-hmm. I just I never really liked it, and then I loved animals. And once I realized the connection between those things, I knew I was a vegetarian Mm -hmm. and I was a vegetarian all through high school. And then when I hit college, I was in a work environment where a lot of people were vegan. It was a nonprofit in DC. And one day my boss just pulled me aside. She's like, Oh, Kathy, you're vegan, right? And I was like, Oh yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And I guess, yeah, I am. Cause I kind of was, but I didn't really know what it was. And from there she educated me on what it was and, I saw all these factory farming videos and, you know, the chicks rolling off the conveyor belt, like shocked me. And Ugh. it was just a whole education there. And from there, I educated myself and continued to where I am today. And so over those 10 years, you wrote cookbooks. You have two super successful websites. You've got all these recipes. And it sounds like to me, you're doing really well, but then you say that you struggled with some stress and grief and anxiety and depression. How did you overcome that? And, you know, what was the source of that when it seems like everything was going so well? Yeah, well, I mean, backstory on us even doing this interview. <laughs> <laughs> sure. It was like over a year ago, and I canceled at the last minute because I had just lost my father, and I literally was trying so hard to fake you know, not fake, but like trying to force myself to put on a happy face. But I've been there. I, I was really going through something where 
you know, I'm going through some stuff. I can't be healthy, happy vegan Kathy right now. So trust us, we we both understand. I've lost my mom. Allie's lost both of her parents. We get it. We're there. We get you. it, and yeah, we're so I'm so, so sorry. Yeah. yeah, it's tough. Yeah, because I mean, I'm I'm 36, so and my parents were older, so a lot of my peer group like hasn't gone through that yet, and mm -hmm. so it always helps when people understand. It's expected, right? You always know, or that's what you think, at least, unless you go before them, but God forbid, but you're going to lose your parents and your grandparents. That's part of life, but you don't think you're going to lose them that young. Right. You know? Right. So absolutely. like, uh, And even when you're expecting it, you don't. No. You're yeah, never prepared. How you're going to feel after it happens. But so, yeah, I mean, my full backstory is. I mean, I've been very open with the fact that I suffered from a pretty severe eating disorder back in high school and college, and I have a whole blog post on that if anybody wants to, <laughs> to learn about that journey. Yeah. But, uh, that was one of my healing things that I've gone through. Wait, may, I, may I ask, what was, the, what was behind your eating disorder? Was it body images, low self-esteem? What was behind that? For me, it was a lot of self-esteem and also just control. control. I was yeah. Yeah. in my junior year in high school, and my sister had left for college, and I was going to be leaving for college soon, and I was such a perfectionist, yeah. and it was just very high expectations of myself. Mm -hmm. And so as my career kind of was starting, I was still recovering from my eating disorder, and I, I really I haven't met a blogger or somebody in the food world who hasn't had some sort of an issue with. It seems like that's why people get into it, right? Yeah, because you have that <laughs> obsession, and it bleeds into it. In the vegan world, there's a lot of healing that goes on when it comes to eating disorders and, and a vegan diet. So there's a very positive side of it too. It really wasn't until I moved to LA when everything started to pick up and I just found myself working and working and working and really in a burnout mode. Oh, we've never been there, right, Sue? <laughs> <laughs> What's that? <laughs> just kidding. We yeah, and totally get it. Again, we totally get it. <laughs> Moving from New York City to LA was also, I mean, I grew up in California. I lived in LA back in like 2000. So I know the city, but New York is such a place where you get out and you walk around and you see people and you're moving all day. And when you're a work from homer, that is so inviting. But LA, mm -hmm. it was suddenly like, okay, I'm at home all day. I don't really have a lot of friends right now because I don't know anybody in the city. I'm a native New Yorker. And oh. um, I, I went to college in Northern California. I went back to New York City after I graduated and then I came to LA. And when I came to L.A. very shortly thereafter, and, and for multiple reasons, not just the city, but I also fell into a very deep depression that I don't think could have existed in my world in New York just because I had to yeah. work so hard to pay my rent. So I, <laughs> I had to hustle so much and be so active just to maintain right. a life there that when I got out here, it was so much easier. It was just easier and slower. But then again, like just like you're saying, like you step out of – Wherever you are, wherever you like, if you're in Manhattan, Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, doesn't matter. There's so many people. There's so much life and energy. When I moved out here, I also experienced like a really dark depression. So yeah, I totally understand very that weird shift. Yeah, very strange. It felt very isolating, and even the physical aspect. Like I would literally go outside of our apartment and try and walk to like Beverly Hills from like West LA and people would just stare at me like I was crazy and I was like people don't walk in LA like I can't do this it was really hard for me to socialize in LA because when I did go to events when I started to kind of connect with some bloggers and go to big events it's a very different type of socializing where it's these big parties and you know I'm an extroverted introvert where I much rather just have like a couple girlfriends come over and have no makeup on and like watch Netflix and drink champagne, <laughs> just like chill out. So I don't know. It's just the LA scene. And it really kind of shocked me when I was already feeling isolated and yeah. weird about the whole situation. And how long ago was that? That was when we first came out here like five years ago. And how has that, has that shifted? Where are you at now? It's changed a lot. I was just in a bad place still then. Like it was, and it got worse. Is that, <laughs> okay, let's talk about it. But, let's talk about it. <laughs> so I got my first cookbook deal while that was going on. And that was a big deal for me because it was a smoothie book. And that was kind of a lifelong goal of mine is to not only have a cookbook, but a smoothie book. Like I have a huge collection of smoothie books. And it was one of my favorite sort of genres of cookbooks. 
I so freaking love smoothies, it. and I think I think I just set an, I think you just set a new goal for me is to have my own <laughs> smoothie book because I love smoothies too. Oh my god, and it's smoothies so are my to favorite write because you're literally just making smoothies all day. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like heaven. So yeah, much fun. It was really fun. It was really great, and I felt like that was getting me out more. I was doing more interviews and going out and promoting the book a bit, and I felt really good, and I was eating really well, and I felt intellectually stimulated because my job was going so well. Mm -hmm. I got my degree in wellness promotion, so if you look at wellness, like wellness isn't just food. It's It's mind, body, spirit. Like The six dimensions of wellness are emotional, social, spiritual, environmental, intellectual, and then physical. And physical is like all the stuff we think of, like food and exercise and everything that's in magazines to like help you be well. But really, that whole social side and spiritual side and emotional side just wasn't getting a lot of attention for me at that time. That makes so much sense. suddenly, while all this great stuff was happening, I felt like I was doing pretty good. My cat, who... I had for 13 years got cancer and oh, God. It's breaking <laughs> my heart. Yeah. And, and she wasn't just a cat to me. Like <laughs> my friend and I have a saying that everybody kind of has a soul pet, like somebody mm-hmm. who saved yeah. you at a hard time. Or, I mean, I literally adopted Nellie in 2001, right after the September 11th attacks when I was really deep in my eating disorder yeah. and really in a bad place. And, that cat just like brought me through so much. So the fact that she had cancer suddenly was like horrible. I'm going to uh, cry right now because I know. <laughs> oh my God. You don't understand. I have almost the same story. It was around the same time, um, early two thousands when I got Charlotte uh-huh. and my mom had died. I had just graduated college and my boyfriend and I had broken up and we had shared a dog together and he kept the dog. So I was like devastated. And then I got Charlotte. And right now she's 12 years old and she has tumors, which we're we're reversing through vitamin C therapy. Like she's doing better. But like I'm like my heart hurts for her every day. I'm so scared all the time. It's awful. It's such a hard journey. And, you know, when she first got diagnosed, the doctor very bluntly was like, you know, give her three months. They say she has three months. And I was like, ah! so- <laughs> sorry, I, Susie, I screamed in your ear. That makes me so mad. It's awful. And we went to like this natural vet and we, we literally spent a lot of money on like these homeopathic like injections. Like I was trying everything. I was trying to give her green Ka- smoothies. Kathy, I, I feel trying- like you're a blend of Allison and myself. I know. Cause we just connected on the depression thing, moving to LA and now you're connected. This is, are you part of us? <laughs> <laughs> she's our, she's, she completes us. You complete us. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, homeopathic injections. Yeah. We tried everything and she was, she was doing well for like a few weeks and I was, and I covered this all on my blog. I was like live blogging it, which was helping me, but yeah, therapy. But in the end, like she just very quickly went. And when she did go, it was very traumatic. Like it wasn't like we didn't do euthanasia and we didn't really know what was going to happen. And yeah, it was, it was traumatic. Like she, it was traumatic. Of course. <laughs> I don't talk about it cause it's awful. But yeah, after that, I just, I really broke like, I was in pajamas like those past three months, like laying on the floor, covered in cat food, syringe feeding her like every three hours. Oh, my God. And I didn't really know what I was going to do. And right after that, I had submitted a book proposal like months ago. Mm -hmm. And I got an approval for my second book proposal. And they're like, do you want to start writing this right now? And I'm like, okay, so I can either – cocoon away and just be completely miserable or I can just throw myself into this book right and I did the book and I worked and photographed hardcore for three months and I pumped it out and yeah it was a spree and in the end like it was all completely worth it because I got to dedicate the book to Nellie so if you have a book the dedication page says Nellie and that's my cat (laughs) I love that so much I actually went right after my book came out. Uh, I went right back into the old patterns. Like mm-hmm. I wasn't, you know, socializing. I was overwhelming myself with work 
completely workaholicing. I even threw a book party, which I never throw parties. <laughs> like, I was just so needed stuff to do and fill myself with work to kind of fill my soul. After that book kind of passed, I was at a place where I was just floating for a while. And then my health started to struggle. Like I started to have little things going wrong. My asthma flared up. I wasn't feeling good. I was super tired at like 6 p.m. All the signs of just like burnout mm -hmm. and all those types of signals from your body telling you you're overdoing it. And then right in the midst of that, my dad passed away. So it was just like this layer of one thing after another after another. That was, you know, obviously really traumatic. I thought I was okay. I had the adrenaline rush of like, okay, I'm doing okay. I'm there for my mom. I'm going to be there for her and I'm strong and get through this. Sure. But about a month after he passed away, and this was just last January, mm -hmm. I was driving home from an allergy shot appointment because I was like trying to heal my asthma. All of a sudden, my heart just started pounding out of my chest. Oh. And I literally, I was driving home at rush hour on Lincoln and I pulled over at a gas station. I pulled out this EpiPen. I was about to stab it in my thigh. Oh my God. <laughs> I am having an allergic reaction. This is crazy. And so I pull over, my heart is racing. I feel like I'm gonna like pass out. I thought I was having a heart attack. I called 911. Oh my God. I'm, like, I, I'm gonna stab this pen. <laughs> like, <laughs> what, is, what is wrong? What should I do? I don't know what to do. I think I'm having some sort of an attack. And they're like, don't stab that in your <laughs> And in like two minutes, like three fire trucks come zooming around the corner, wow. pull into the gas station. And literally 10 firefighters that look like they just stepped out of the firefighters of Santa Monica calendar. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Thank I'm you. I'm walking over to my car and oh I'm just like God. standing there. I'm so embarrassed. Oh my God. They take my vitals. Like my Wait. heart starts to calm down a little. Were you having a panic attack? It was a panic attack. Yeah. And I didn't know that at the time. And I kind of went back to the allergist. I was like, I don't know what that was. What was that? You know, shout out to the Santa Monica firefighters. They were awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and like, hot, I apparently. I love but, me some and, firefighters. <laughs> and so I, I had a panic attack. And I had never had a panic attack before in my life. I didn't know what it felt they, like. They suck, don't they? They're crazy. Yeah, like, they really, really suck. I've had them since the third grade. And, every, yeah. <laughs> and everyone I hear tell the story of their first one, it's just like your story, Kathy. They don't know what's wrong. Yeah. They don't I know. I went on Facebook. I was like, oh, my gosh, guys. I don't know what happened. I had this, like, allergic reaction. Well, and I've, 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 heard so, I've heard this from so many. Usually w w when people are adults and they have it, and they're like, I'm having a heart attack. I need to call right. EMA. Yeah. I was in third grade. I was, what is that, nine, ten? Yeah. And I was in a restaurant with my family and I was like I just needed to go to the car and I just went to the car mm -hmm. so it's so interesting to me that like um, to me I went inside I just like took this e extreme fight or flight response uh -huh. which is what it is you feel like you're going to die yeah and I was like yeah. I'm just gonna go into a car <laughs> yeah and other people are like help me and I've seen it happen too with friends like I've seen this on TV a lot too which is random maybe they're catching on and they want to educate people where people are like I'm having a heart attack and then they go to the doctor and they're like you had a panic attack due to stress so it's becoming huh. more mainstream interesting <laughs> yeah. it's a fascinating thing though because it's it's the fight or flight response our bodies are dealing with this kind of socialized stress in a way that we were meant to run away. It, it's from usually like, you know, running away from a threat, uh, a snake, a bear, fire, uh, a mm -hmm. cougar, mm -hmm. something like that. For, for the most part in the world, I mean, there's some people that still deal with that, but for the most part, people in cities and stuff don't face that, but it's these other stressors that can trigger that response. And it's horrible to experience. Yeah, I mean, I had that one and I thought, it was just a one-time incident, but it felt like to me, I described it as rolling panic attacks because I just kept having them and I was having nightmares at night of my dad. I started to go to a therapist after that because I was freaking out. <laughs> Good choice. There's that podcast that you guys had on. Don't freak out. Yes. <laughs> that should have been what I should have been listening to because I was describing myself as like a nervous wreck. Like I couldn't explain why I was just having these rolling panic attacks. Mm -hmm. So for the next few months, I went to every single doctor you can imagine. 
I have Hashimoto's thyroid, so I thought my thyroid was messed up. I thought I was in like adrenal fatigue mode. I had an ACTH test. I had MRIs. Like I had everything. And of course, doctors, they just, they want to just give you a pill and right. have you go on your way. I went to acupuncturist and a naturopath and all of these things. It really didn't give me any answers. And that was very, very frustrating. That's exactly what happened to me. That's exactly what happens to so many guests is like, no one can diagnose you and no one can give you an answer as to what's going on. Yeah, we're all so different. And that's where like listening to your body and your own intuition really comes into play. Like, that's why I was kind of telling the doctors, like, I don't need a pill. Like, I just need this explained. So I know <laughs> going on yeah I read as many books as possible on these types of things and I was watching YouTube videos and everybody said to start feeding your parasympathetic nervous system yes like the relaxation responses so I pulled out my watercolors I started painting I started meditating I made my husband and I watch friends every night or something just like cracking up I, love I started that. exercising again, which was huge for me. My asthma kind of fell away, thank goodness. Mm. And I could actually start cardio exercise again. Mm-hmm. And I was journaling like crazy. I was getting massages and going out in nature. And all of those things were so healing that it's kind of unbelievable. You know, our lives are so crazy, so filled with stimuli and yep. stress that we don't even really acknowledge. Well, we, don't, we don't have time. Yeah, (laughs) it's true. I think when you're experiencing, first of all, when you lose someone in your life, especially a family member, especially a parent or a child, like it's you're going through a grieving period and everybody's different. I was a zombie for a year when I lost my mother. I remember, I think like six weeks after she passed, I looked in the mirror and I I didn't recognize myself. That was scary. I looked in the mirror. I was like, who the hell is that? I've I've never seen myself look like that before. And you have to be gentle with yourself. And I don't think that's something that Americans do until they're brought to this kind of point. Like we're always so concerned about achieving and striving and getting and buying and status and followers and and what are you wearing and we forget that we're all just human and our human experience includes loss and it includes grief and it includes shitty times that you cannot control (laughs) no matter what effects or commercials want to show you like we're 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 kind of fed this part of my language bullshit Mm -hmm. that life should be happy and perfect all the time no matter what and you know what it's not and for me when mine wasn't, even like you, when things were apparently supposedly good before the real crap started to happen, before I had loss and, and uh, you know, bigger problems, I'd, I'd been battling anxiety and depression since I was a kid and panic attacks. My point is, is that I agree with you. It's really, really important to be gentle with yourself, to slow down, to ask yourself, what do I need? Do I need a massage? Hell yeah. I love <laughs> massages. I love body work. That's why I did it for so many years. I think it's a, it's very important. I never understood people that don't like it. It's really, really healing. You know, yeah. it's important to, to allow yourself to be vulnerable, to reach out to a friend and say, I'm having a really shitty time. Can I come over and you give me some wine? Or can I come over and you give me a hug? Well, that's exactly what happened today before the podcast started. Like, just, I mean, I'll just be honest right now. Like, I was having a hard time because Charlotte was at the vet and they called me five minutes before we're recording and Susie and Roxy had just gotten here and I'm like in tears and I'm like, I I walked out and I couldn't even fake a smile and I just needed, and all Susie did was hug me and I was like, okay, Mm -hmm. thank you. I'm so sorry. There's, you know what? When we're going through shit, why fake it? I am so good at faking it, and I got so good. I was just like you, Kathy, and then I learned that that was the worst thing I could possibly do, and now I'm vulnerable and I'm real, and I'm not perfect by any means, but I feel my feelings instead of pushing them down, and my life is better. Yeah. And that's the secret. I mean, that's something (laughs) my my eating disorder really taught me is how to fake it, because when you have an eating disorder, you want to keep it, and to do that, you have to pretend like you're fine. You're fine. I'm fine. I'm totally fine. So I got really good at doing that. Yeah. And it's just been, you know, in the past few years, I've really, I will say I'm an open book. (laughs) I I don't know why more people aren't like that nowadays. Because it's, (laughs) because you know what, it's 
freaking hard to admit that you're hurting. It it's is. It's hard to We're admit proud. that you're suffering. Yeah. You don't, you want to say face. You want to say, I have the perfect we marriage. We don't want to be judged. Yeah. Or I'm, I have it together. Or I don't have an eating disorder. Or I don't have a panic disorder. Or, you know, because then you're flawed. And, but. Right you know what? Everybody's got their shit. Yeah. That is what living 40 years on this earth has taught me because I always used to think other people are doing it. They're, they're succeeding more than I am. They've ha they have it together and they're faking it too. They're fake. Well, <laughs> they're faking the it too. They're faking it too. Or they have their workaholics or their alcoholics or their sexaholics or they're cheating on their spouses or their kids are miserable or it sucks to even like admit to yourself I'm not okay right now. Yeah. Because it's scary. Because you're like, am I ever going to be okay? What's wrong with me? I'm not perfect. I'm losing control. What's going to happen? You know, all of these, everybody's had these kinds of questions, right? It sucks. But if you're feeling that, it is so much better to be honest with yourself. And like I said, to be yeah. gentle with yourself and to seek help from a friend, from a relative, from some, a trusted source a therapist and you know what I even experienced like when I first started therapy I had a shitty therapist me too <laughs> and I had to go you know what I'm a mess right now but I don't think you're gonna help me so I'm gonna find someone else <laughs> and I had to bounce around mm -hmm. you have to be your own best advocate mm -hmm. it, it's really really hard if you're depressed because that's anger turned inward I've heard that over and over again yeah and and anxiety is fear the depression is is looking in the rearview mirror and anxiety is fear of the future mm-hmm and I cannot stress to you enough how that took a long time for me to understand where I was living in one of those two worlds, pain of the past and fear of the future. The joy in life is living in the present moment. And one of my biggest lessons was I thought that healing grief meant I heal it, I do my therapy, and then I move on and I'm healed and I'm happy. No. I legit thought that for like a few of years. Of course you did. Yeah. yeah. And so I suppressed all this stuff and then I was like, oh, you have to feel it to heal it. So I'm like, I'm going to heal myself. So then I went to University of Santa Monica, which is basically the school on loving yourself and forgiveness of judgment. La, 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 la. So I was like, after those two years, I'm going to be healed over my I'm grief. done. I'm done. Give me my degree. Exactly. And that was all my ego talking. Healing is ongoing. Happiness yeah. is ongoing. It's so slow and it never ends too. There's always something new that you can learn about yourself and But that's what res that's what wisdom comes from. You and know, that that's that's how we get to be wise old ladies. Yes. Is is to I'm serious, is to That's how we help people with feel our stories. Our crap and keep and have the courage to keep going. Because it's easy to give up. It's easier to give up. I don't want to say it's easy. It's painful. But it's easier to give up than to go, you know what, maybe this will get better. Maybe this will pass. Maybe it won't. But to have the courage to say, I'm going to try. I deserve happiness. Yeah. And so right. I know we've talked about today, like overcoming our anxiety, our depression, our grief. And Susie, you mentioned something that helps you is being in gratitude. So what are some of you guys' like happy tips? Like how can we get into a place of happiness? For me, it's meditation and moving through my pain rather than pushing it down. Susie, for you, you said it's gratitude. Like, Kathy, what are some of your tools to happiness? Really, laughter has been so huge for me. And yes. It, and laughter is really so healing. It gets those endorphins going, your serotonin, all of that. Um, and then the same you know, effect as that is exercise has been super healing for me. I wasn't exercising for many of those years that I was feeling very depressed. Well, when you're depressed, you don't want to fucking go outside and move. <laughs> you want to sit in front of the TV right. and just sit there and stare. You don't. I, I experienced that, too. And I had a, a very expensive appointment with a New York psychiatrist who was ex trained at a very expensive university, very well known. And he sat there and I'd read his book and I was talking, I was thinking about going back on antidepressants, which for me didn't really work. Uh, they worked a little bit. The, the lows weren't as low and the highs weren't as high, but I still wasn't smiling mm -hmm. as my boyfriend liked to tell me. And my, this very expensive New York uh, psychiatrist said, well, statistically they have shown that regular exercise that gets your heart pumping is as effective as antidepressants. Do you think you can try that? Do you think you can get yourself into a routine? And I was like, well, yeah, considering that statistic because <laughs> antidepressants didn't work, yes, I will, I, I, I can do that. And you know what, just like you, when I did apply that, it helped. But when, yeah. but when the thing that is not well, your brain, is in control of your decisions and going, I could go for a run or go to the gym or go to class pass or go to Pilates or go to whatever, or I could sit here 
and stare at the wall and be <laughs> sad. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, it doesn't make the best decisions. But if you can get yourself to that point and go, I'm going to commit to 30 minutes of walking, I'm going to commit to my hour of hour and a half of yoga, I'm going to commit, whatever it is. Uh, if it gets your heart pumping, statistically, statistically it has shown to be as effective as antidepressants. And I heard you say that in another podcast, and I wanted to comment on it because <laughs> I actually had the exact same thing happen. When I was going through, I actually started to get really bad migraines too. And the migraines were making me dizzy. They're called vestibular migraines. Mm. And that is really, really treacherous to your life. Like you can't do a lot of things. You can't drive when you're dizzy. You can't. Yeah. It's debilitating. Go out and socialize normally. So I actually went all the way to Mayo Clinic in Minnesota to Mm -hmm. meet with this specialist. He's like the specialist on this condition and wow. he sat me down and he told me the exact same thing that you said. <laughs> like, he said exercise, oh, the lifestyle doing some physical therapy, which is essentially like the same thing as, you know, yoga. It's like balance training and like helping mm. strengthen your vestibular system. Yeah. I loved my physical therapy. I was like, I'm getting in shape, but physical therapy. <laughs> yeah. And doing exercise to boost your serotonin because serotonin is actually connected to anything with your vestibular system when you're dealing with vertigo. It's some, all it, connected. Yeah, it's all connected. <laughs> <laughs> so important. You know, I want to I wanna give a small applause right now to <laughs> the medical industry because they are shifting. They are coming around. There are certain one, par, certain MDs that are going, oh, yes. maybe we don't have all the answers. Maybe there is more to, <laughs> more to lifestyle. And, you know, when diet and exercise don't work, they always work. Diet and exercises always work if you do them. Yeah, you have to do them. You can't just talk about them or think about them. Right. And let me ask you ladies a question. Have you ever done a workout and then been like, I regret that? Uh, yeah, I feel so good. Yep. Like, <laughs> no, I have. I'll tell you right now. Bar method. <laughs> have you done bar method? No, but um, that's not the way this yeah. is supposed to go. <laughs> <laughs> no, not for, the, not for the reason you think. Not for the reason you think. It was just really, really painful. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm joking. I'm joking. Everybody knows I'm the comic relief. Okay, I'm going to ask again. You want to do the, take two. Take two. <laughs> Roxy, cut that. She's not going to want it in. <laughs> Roxy's like, I made Roxy laugh. No. Um, oh no, God. Allison, I've never regretted a workout. <laughs> no, it's just because it was, spinning was really, really hard too. But it did not, it, but I left, I walked out of there not depressed. I wasn't thinking about sadness. Right. And the, what I was going to compare it to is, have you ever regretted Last night, I ate too much food and laid on the couch. Yes, every time, right? Yeah. And the truth is, is that is a type of soothing that is only temporary, that never makes us happy in the long run. Do you know which which type of exercise I walked away from not only feeling better, but feeling super, super aroused? Ooh. <laughs> yes. Pole class. Yes! <laughs> How did I know? You didn't even tell me. I you just ha- knew. Well, what, what else would, what else would it po- be? It's popular in LA. Like, girls always tell me about their pole class. Oh, my class. God. My friend won. Or no, she bid She bid on a charity auction. She bid on some, like, private pole dancing classes for a group. A group. Yeah. And she won. Mm-hmm. And so I was invited. And I was not expecting... <laughs> <laughs> to come out of that class and go home. This is when I, before I met Mike, go home to my then boyfriend and be like, hello. <laughs> it was very, it was awesome, actually. <laughs> I highly recommend it. Anybody listening, if you've never, any ladies, if you've never tried pole class, go try it. Sounds fun. It's fun. So, Kathy, can you take us back to your website and your entrepreneurial endeavors and tell us a little bit more about your books, why you decided to start your website, and what people can find there. Sure. So many bloggers have great reasons for why they started. I really feel like I fell into blogging. Like It just kind of evolved into a career. (laughs) But once I got into it, I was just super excited to be a voice for vegan recipes but I was speaking to people who are not necessarily vegan. Mm-hmm. And, you know, not, not all of my audience was vegan. I, in the beginning, most people were just asking me questions about nutritional yeast and what is tempeh and how do I use all these chickpeas I have? And yeah. just all these- <laughs> <laughs> I have so many chickpeas and I don't know what to do. Help. Watch <laughs> Kathy's videos because let me, can I just give, I feel like Kathy is being really modest. Her website, everything, all her photos, all her videos are such high, 
high, high quality. <laughs> and so let me just shout you out because you're not going to do it yourself, which is fine. No, I'm not. <laughs> but literally, if you are looking for good recipes, great blog posts, how to use these ingredients, your videos and your pictures are so beautiful. They're so detailed. They're so creative. Like, I'm going to give you a shout out because I'm like super impressed with what you're doing. Thank you. I appreciate that. I do. I put so much love into my recipes. It comes across. And it's I just I love doing it. I love the photography aspect. I, I love doing videos now. I'm trying to get into the video trend. Um one of my most popular recipes is my sweet potato veggie burgers with avocado. Mm. It has, I think, 800,000 shares on my blog. I thought and... you were going to say 800,000 calories. I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it's so fattening, but so good. Yeah, and then my other, you know, my two cookbooks are 365 vegan smoothies, which is filled with smoothie tips and recipes. And the smoothies are based on, like, wellness profiles like energy and heart healthy and things like that so it's kind of fun for specific wellness issues my other cookbook is healthy happy vegan kitchen and it has everything from breakfast lunch to dinner in between it's all of my favorite recipes that I've been making for years all of the most popular recipes on my blog I tried to get in there too so it's really a comprehensive mm -hmm. guide for anybody who's curious about more vegan recipes and adding more plants to their diet, which is something I think everybody should be doing nowadays. Absolutely. And you have a Finding Vegan Facebook group and people can collaborate and work together. Can you tell us a little bit about that? We have a lot of food bloggers as well. Yeah. So Finding Vegan is open to any blogger who does recipes that are vegan. So if you're a blogger and you're posting vegan recipes, you can start submitting your recipes to Finding Vegan. And you can also join our Facebook group, which we do recipe roundups and we talk about vegan blogger industry stuff. <laughs> and it's just a really great community of people. It is. Uh, and then I feature some of the recipes on the Facebook page and on Twitter. And we even have a Finding Vegan app for iPhone. That's awesome. IPhone. I and love it. Yeah. And so what can people find on the app? How does it work? The app is the website in an app form, but it makes it very easy to browse and search. So you can search for any food. Like if you want to veganize anything, just put it in the search. And I promise you there's probably a recipe for it. We have over 116,000 recipes that have already been posted to Finding Vegan. So basically wow. everything is up there. That might be one of the most comprehensive apps on the web for this. Yeah, it's really awesome how many recipes we've gotten over the years. 116,000? You guys don't understand how modest Kathy's being. Kathy <laughs> is huge. What she's doing is everywhere, and what she's doing is so unique because of what you said earlier, the love that you put into it. And I'm not knocking anyone. I know a lot of people put love into her their blogs, but she puts so much time, energy, effort, and love into what she's doing, and it comes across. And I am a person that, I'm sorry, Kathy, but I don't like people's videos that don't put effort into their videos. Your videos are high, I'm a producer, okay? I've been doing this for <laughs> yes, way too are. long. Yes, you so are. I appreciate anyone that does this and does it well. And so I feel like she's not giving herself enough credit. So I just have to give her credit because her stuff is really, really, really good. She's modest. Informative and beautiful. Thank you. I appreciate that. She's a hippie, she's a hippie girl from Santa Cruz. She's modest. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, is there anything else you want to add or do you want to tell people um, how they can work with you or buy your cookbooks, find you online, all that good stuff? You know, I would love people to say hi over on my website. I love hearing from my readers. And if you have any questions about anything involving veganism or panic attacks or anything <laughs> I'm talking about veganism I'm during panic attacks. <laughs> <laughs> I really just love talking completely candidly with my readers about anything that they want to talk about. You know, say hello to me on Instagram or Twitter. I love Twitter. I'm on there every day. Great. So shout out all your social media handles. On Twitter, I'm Lunchbox Bunch. On Instagram, I'm Kathy Patowski and Finding Vegan. All the Finding Vegan ones are all Finding Vegan. For myself, it's Lunchbox Bunch on Facebook and Twitter, and then Kathy Patelsky on Instagram. 
awesome. So look for Kathy Patelsky all over social media, Finding Vegan as well. Her two books, 365 Vegan Smoothies and Healthy, Happy Vegan Kitchen. Thank you so much for being here, Kathy. We really appreciate it. Thank you, you, Kathy. I love this podcast. I've been listening to them nonstop the past couple days, and they've just been so lovely. Major shout out to Kathy for sharing her story with us. We know this is something that so many people suffer from. So we hope Kathy's story helps you realize that you're not alone. I think that's one of the biggest factors is like if you feel depressed, if you're not in your happy place, it's just good to feel that you're not the only one feeling that way sometimes. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I mean, people that are depressed need support. Yeah. And it's that I've said, I think I said this in our interview, it's that the thing that's not well is the thing that's making your decisions and mm-hmm. keeping you from probably maintaining relationships or asking, even asking for help. Yeah, that's so true. And, you know, one of the uh, tenants, I think is the right word, of the people who live to 100 years old in the blue zones is their their community. They are yeah. so connected. Yeah, they're surrounded by people all the time. They're not alone. Yeah, so mm-hmm. I think, like, of all the tips we go through and everything like that, it's like reach out to someone, talk to people, and know that you're not alone because you're absolutely not. You know how many people are on this planet? A lot. <laughs> yeah. A so lot. you can always get connected. And before the interview, we told you that we'd tell you more about our friend JJ's fabulous new program, the Invisible Fitness Academy. Yes. So we're going to tell you all about that right now. In the Academy, you will learn how to gain the inner peace and self-acceptance that acts as a catalyst for change. How to feel at home in your body, which brings you more peace, happiness, energy, and vitality. Strategies that increase your metabolism and allow you to burn more calories at rest, which I know, but I always need to hear. (laughs) (laughs) Where to find answers about why you have trouble sleeping, experience brain fog, feel stressed, anxious, or sluggish, and how to eat to repair these problems naturally. How to slow down the aging process naturally. My favorite. Ice? Is it just freezing yourself? I'm, I'm, I'm really curious about that one. Yeah. I'd love to know. A process for identifying the root causes of your addictive behaviors. Problem solve those behaviors in a healthy way and break free of them so you can live healthy and happy. And there's so much more Food Heals Nation. Go to foodhealsnation.com slash JJ. And also during the five months of training with JJ, you'll also get five months of never before heard podcast episode in our Food Heals VIP club we created just for for you. That's right. Yeah. Some of those episodes are like the, this is one of my favorites actually, where um, Susie practiced tapping on me. So it's called emotional freedom technique, tapping trauma away with Susie Hare. That's me. <laughs> How to supercharge your manifestation process with the lovely Alita McDaniel. Love her. How to turn your body into a belly fat burning machine with the sexy fit vegan Ella Majors. How to make an apple pie skinny smoothie with the lovely Allison Melody. Oh, thank you. And so much more. So make a commitment today to join us for the next five months of transformation. You can do it. You can do it. You know, we're doing it. We're always a work in process. We'll be doing it right along with you. Go to foodhealsnation.com slash JJ. See you next time, Food Heals Nation. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, developing a more positive outlook on life. In rare cases, people have experienced a strong desire to put in their Lululemons and take a yoga class while drinking a green juice. If you experience any of these symptoms, text your priest immediately. (laughs) 